Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? We're doing well? Still got energy? A little bit? Good, excellent. Um, so I'm Ross Mason. I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, some of the lessons I learned building a company over the last 12 years. I actually exited um, a, a couple of years ago, and since then I've been working on venture. But what I've learned by working with early stage founders is there's a lot of things that you learn on the journey that you forget, and then you realize they're actually really important. So I tried to distill some of them in this, this talk this afternoon. All right, so a bit about me. Uh, first thing is I started life as an open source developer, um, and I built the first uh, project, which was called Mule. And for better or for worse, by the way, when you name an open source project, it can stick with you for many, many years. <laughs> I thought Mule was kind of funny, and then, of course, we became MuleSoft, and I had to always justify why a serious company was named after a donkey. So that was always a bit tricky. Uh, but I started the open source project, and then 2006, uh, it got lots of traction, especially in banking, and we raised uh, some capital. Back then, there was no seed rounds, so you couldn't get, there was no angels, so you had to really go and raise money on some sort of market traction which today has become much easier, I think, to get started as a, uh, as a founder. And then in 2008, a bit like what's happening right now, we went through a financial crash. Um, and there were some really big learnings there just around how to communicate with your team, how to deal with things like making redundancies for those who have staff that you have to reduce. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that. And then in 2017, we went IPO. Of course, that's one of the areas where many of you want to go, right? And it was a nice, easy, straight road to get to IPO. No problems. You know, we just hired, we got customers. It all worked out flawlessly. Uh, and then, amazingly, we got acquired by Salesforce in 2018. Um, so we also experienced a very large acquisition. But I'm going to start, you know, the learnings I learned were really most relevant in the first two to four years of building Mulesoft, because that's kind of where most people tend to be. Um, if you want to know about later stuff, I can, you know, grab me afterwards, we can talk about it. And uh, since leaving uh, Salesforce, I actually set up a fund. And I'll, t I'll tell a bit of time on this, because one of my big passions, it turns out, is I love building, right? I build all sorts of things from companies I uh, just built a house recently in Switzerland. I build Lego. Uh, in fact, my house has a whole room which looks like a Lego museum where we build stuff all the time with my kids. Um, I'm, I just love building. And I actually, I think about venture a bit in the same way. Rather than deploying capital, I'm actually building a firm that really, really helps founders in the earlier stages uh, by providing a lot more support and guidance on a lot of the tactical stuff that founders struggle with when starting early stage companies. So this is really, if you like, my next company versus me turning VC. Just thought I'd throw it out there, so I said it. OK, um, I think the first thing, and this is something that we tell all our founders at Dig Ventures, we've invested in 28 companies, 29 now actually to date. Um, and founders often are looking for mentors. They want to talk to people like me, who've been through it, and have some good guidance on hiring, on uh, building culture, expansion. That's all good, but you also want coaches and peers. Because the problem with the things that you struggle with as a founder in the early two to four years is often it's smaller, more tactical things. Right about hiring your first executive, around how to run founder-led sales, how to do PLG well. And the best people to speak about on those types of topics are actually your peers in market or, other, or coaches who are also doing roughly the same thing, but maybe just a year or two ahead of you. Right? So we, we always push our founders to make sure they don't just seek exited founders as their, as their cohort of people that advise them, but really have people that are in, in the trenches with them struggling with the same types of problems. So, you know, good exercise. After this session, don't do it now, but just introduce yourself to the person next to you, and uh, hopefully you'll find some mentors and peers that way. Sorry, some peers and coaches that way. And the reason why 
peers and coaches are better than mentors is the way they engage, right? So asking questions is far better than telling you what to do, right? So mentors tell you what they did. They don't tell you what to do, but they tell you what they did. But peers and coaches actually ask questions that help you figure out how to identify the problem in front of you and how to solve that problem. And I love that method. I do that method actually in investing as well. One of the reasons um, founders like us when we're talking to them early on before we've invested is I ask completely different questions to every other venture firm. And because I'm really trying to understand the person and the idea and the idea behind the idea. Uh, and this is just a much more effective way to get founders or anyone really to think about how to proceed with you know, whatever they want to do next. So I kind of love this, this sort of quadrant. Quality of questions, there's no magic answer to the quality. You just have to get good at asking questions over time. Um, and then bias for action. As founders, uh, typically, they all have a bias for action. And the people that ask the best questions and have a bias for action tend to do the best. And I look for that in the founders I invest in. It certainly describes the, way, the person I grew into in my journey as well. Now, here's another one. Um, a lot of our companies, we back really early at pre-seed. And if, if any of you, actually, quick show of hands, who is starting a company right now, and like you're in the first year of starting? OK, like 20. What about, uh, how many founders in the room? Another quick show of hands. OK. What are the rest of you doing here? <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this. I hope it's good. Um, so as early stage founders, for the, the folks that put their hand up first, quite often you end up doing some sort of pivot. And a pivot is a bad word in venture. Like, you know, investors get a bit nervous when you say I'm pivoting. But actually what I've found uh, over the last four years of investing is pivoting isn't all bad. It's just there's a lot of assumptions you make very early on around what you can achieve as a company and then either there was a wrong assumption or the market changes a bit like right now, right? Uh, remote work was you know, a, an assumption that might change a bit over the next two years and you've got to be ready for things like that. Uh, hiring, uh, assumptions around that might change in terms of who you can bring in and when. Um, so uh, my learning here is pivoting itself is not hard, bad, but you've got to bring your company along with you. And you should also bring your investors along too. And I guess the, mess, the one learning I've learned is don't try and hide this stuff from people, especially in the organization. Even if it means you, know, you're going, you have to go in another direction, the people that are working on the current direction start to freak out. Right? They're like, what do you mean we're not doing that anymore? That's what I do. That's, that, that's why I'm here, right? So you ha but you've got to address that immediately, because if you don't address it, what you end up doing is perpetuating this sort of nervous energy inside your organization where people don't quite know where they stand. And so uh, I bring this up because probably about half of our pre-seed investments end up doing some sort of pivot. And we're always telling them, like, make sure everyone knows where you are. Even if you don't have the answer, um, let them know where you are. Let them know where you're heading. Bring them along on the journey. And people are a lot le less nervous. It makes any major changes much easier. This is sort of related, but it's actually even more important in this type of era where everything is slowing down, is transparency over authority. People often, first-time CEOs in particular, suffer from this, right? First-time CEOs often believe, because they're the CEO, two things. They're not necessarily allowed to ask too many questions because they're supposed to know. That's not true, right? You should be asking questions all the time. If you know, you're worried about asking your investors, that's why you want to have peers and coaches around you, because you want to be asking questions all the time. Right? So first time CEOs suffer from this. We often suggest that CEOs get coaches to help them you know, figure, figure this bit out. But also, because they lead the organization, they believe they have to shield the organization from anything bad happening. So the feel-good stuff comes in, the first customers, the, the stories from users, CEOs love talking about that, but when there's this real, you know, investors say, hey, you need to get runway for the next, you know, 24, 36 months, and you think, well, I can't run for 24, 36 months on the current cash flow unless I make some cuts. And then the next thing that CEOs do is don't tell anyone about that except for a couple of people. It starts to leak, 
and then you get this, this or even worse, companies in your cohort start announcing that they're releasing people, and you're like, are we next? We don't know, and everyone gets nervous. Again, you want to manage that, that nervousness around. Sometimes you can say, look, we're assessing, it's fine, but don't ignore it, right? Be transparent, and then if there is a plan in place, the other thing I'd say with just hiring, because this isn't really a tip in here, but if you are going to um, make layoffs, it's much better to do it in one go than in drips and feeds. It's not in here, but I'm going to just say it because people are going through that right now. Um, it's better that you, you know, cut once and then everyone can just get back to working than you cut once and then twice. That second cut hurts you so much because everyone's waiting for the third cut. And again, organizations get nervous energy, and you want to you, you calm that down, make sure people understand where they are. They don't, don't have to worry about something unexpected coming down the pipe. So transparency is key. All right, so I lived through the last crash, by the way. Um, actually, when I created this presentation, we weren't in a crash, but we thought we might going into one. Um, I did this at the Swiss Economic Thought Forum. And, um, I talked a bit about how to manage, manage through this. And in a crash, the first thing you want to do is not tell everyone everything's OK, right? Especially if you don't know everything's OK. Like, I hear this a lot. Like, I ask founders, is like, so how, you know, how do you think Q, Q4 is going to go from a revenue standpoint? And they're like, fine, I don't think we're impacted. It's like, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> like, I think you might be impacted. And uh, I like to have a deeper conversation and, and make sure people are being honest. It's much better to be this defensive and say, you know what, we're going to probably reduce our targets by 30%, and then only you know, miss by 25%. That's much better than not reducing and missing by 25%, right? So again, it, a lot of managing a company and a lot of like, the lessons for first-time founders is getting good at being transparent, but also getting good at communicating when you don't have all the information. Right, I think that was the biggest learning I learned through the crash. So my story for the 2008 was we had about 4 million ARR. We are a SaaS business, and most of our customers were financial services, two of which completely disappeared in 2008. I won't name names, but like just dis I didn't think banks could do that. I didn't think that was a possibility that a bank could disappear. Um, but it obviously is, and we've seen it again very recently with FTX, even though it's not a bank. Um, and suddenly, I had some hard choices to make. And uh, my investors were pushing me. They, they said, look, most of your customers are banks. Uh, a bunch of them have not got to renew. A bunch more might reduce their commitments. You're not making any new sales. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, what do you mean, what do I want to do? It's like, well, uh, should, we, should we call it a day and, 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 and shut it down? Uh, and I basically told them, I said, look, give me a weekend to go think about it. I went away, I went a lot of long walks, and I realized that I, I truly believed in the mission that we, we were on, to connect the world's applications, data, and devices. That was the mission of MuleSoft. And I believe we were further ahead than anyone else in the market. But what I didn't believe was that we had a customer base that we could sell to at that time. And I, I told them that. I said, look, I believe in the first two things. The fir third thing, I can't tell you we're going to drive revenue in this market because we've been focused in financial services. And because I did that, they said, great, well, we're going to back you, because that makes sense, and we're going to figure out how to reduce burn. And we decided that, you know what, we're going to get rid of everyone in the organization that doesn't build software, and we'll keep building software to build a product from a year from now that will be more suitable for people other than banks. Not many people know this about MuleSoft, but it was, it was like kind of a big pivot for us. It was like we had to go and do something else. And to the organization, I explained it to them all the way through, right? I, I, I told them that the, the you know, investors had asked me this. I told them that this is how I was thinking about it. And it was really interesting. Rather than people getting freaked out, people said, I understand. I get this, why you would do this. I don't feel like you pulled the rug from me because you have a real reason why you would get rid of anything that's customer facing and just focus on engineering because we just decided we we're going to do zero revenue in 20, 2009. That was, that was the, the plan. Uh, and it worked out really well. But uh, the reason why this was a big learning for me is I agonized for like four weeks during the, the cycle of just trying to tell everyone everything was OK, even though there was you know, stories of Bear Stearns going under and you know, banks being bailed out. And I tried to hide it. And the more I hid it, the more people got nervous. And in the end, I, I, you know, 
by trial by fire, I just realized actually the best way was to be completely honest because I couldn't deal with the stress of trying to hold it all on my own. So that was a good learning from, and people might be going through this now. Okay, interviewing. How many people are interviewing right now? Maybe not so many. Oh, still quite a few of you. Okay, brilliant. Oh, actually interviewing to hire people versus interviewing for a job. All right, still the same people, okay. Um, one thing I didn't even, even occur to me, because this wasn't my story, but what I've found in a lot of the companies that we've invested in is every now and again we, we get a, a really, really smart founder who says, I don't really hire people, that's not my thing. I'm going to hire a head of people to go do it. And then that's how we're going to hire the next 10 people. And, I, and I've learned to ask in the diligence process of the company formation is like, how do you feel about hiring? Because it's a real miss. Like, it, it's, there's, and there are venture firms out there that say things like, hey, we'll help you with your hiring. We'll take care of your hiring. But for a founder starting a company, the most important thing you do day to day is bring in amazing people into the organization and really think about the composition of those people. And if you've never done it before, it's fine. You've just got to go do it. And again, if you've got coaches and you've got peers, talk to them about their practices, about the way they do hiring. But you'll find as you build a company, probably your biggest value add, you don't maybe realize this right now, but the biggest one will be your ability to attract talent and bring them into the organization and establish a culture that is set up to build the things that you want to build, right? So that's quite important. So you have to be really, really involved with it. And to give you some idea of how much effort this is, at MuleSoft, even at 1,000 people, there was only, I was still one of the interview panel for almost every hire, definitely every manager in the whole organization. We also had a CEO at that time, and he was also in the same boat. And we did that to keep the bar super high on making sure that we brought in the right people. But guess how much time that took us? You're not going to guess, but it was about 35% of our time was spent on hiring. Right? Think about that. We were, you know, 100 going to 200 million in revenue. We had customers all over the world. We had offices all over the place. Yet the core exec team was still spending 35% of their time hiring, even though we had a large organization. And I'm not saying that's necessarily the right way to go, but it's actually a pretty good way to go if you want to build teams of people that execute on, uh, on what you're trying to do. And, and so certainly when you're young, as, as a first-time founder, getting really good at hiring is super important. I cannot stress this enough. I also recommend a book. This book is fantastic. It's a little bit old, actually, but I've read it again fairly recently, and it still really holds true. Um, this book called Hire With Your Head just helps people understand how to decipher and ask the right questions to get the right information from people. So the one thing I'd say is make it mandatory reading early on. Read it yourself a bunch of times. And then every six months, read chapter four. Chapter four is great. If you haven't got time to read the book, it's not the end of the world. No one's got time to read books right now, I know. But chapter four is amazing because it just reminds you how to conduct a really good interview and just go in there without a biased mindset and just ask the right questions and keep digging. And so typically in an interview, I don't try and cover everything. I go deep on one thing, and I really understand everything that that person did and who was around them and what they did um, to get a really good idea of how that person thinks, how they function in an organization. It allows you to understand what kind of person they are, the way they reason, and also allows you to dig into a key achievement. Right? These are all the things you're looking for in an interview. Anyway, this. I can't stress this enough. This is probably one book you should read, but definitely chapter four. Okay, this is, this is one I think investors love. Do people know what the, the term BHAG is? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Right, something that sounds so almost, not necessarily insane, because they, sometimes they sound insane. You're like, okay, calm down. But like some really big goal that will end up defining what kind of company you end up building. And there's, there's only one type of BHAG that is great. And it's one that ends up defining the way the company goes to market. And there's a, like, there's, some, there's a couple of really good examples out there. But I, 
I was, uh, one of the best ones I ever heard was actually from Atlassian. People know Atlassian? Yeah, so you use them for Jira, issue management, and Confluence. I was employee number four at Atlassian, and when I walked into their office, they had this big map on the wall with like two red dots on it, and it said map of world domination. And below at the bottom, it, uh, uh, it said their target number of customers was 50,000, right? And their goal was to get 50,000 customers, which doesn't sound like a BHAG, right? That just sounds like, oh, that's just, I want 50,000 customers. But if you peel it back, that goal caused them to make a lot of decisions that have shaped that company to the where it is today, right? Because they had wanted 50,000 customers, they didn't want to have sales. And up until a few years ago, they had, you know, they were very, you know, they got to over a billion in revenue without sales. Or they say that, I'm not sure if that's true. But um, no sales, it meant everything had to be self-service. This is before PLG. They, they decided that people should be able to just swipe a credit card, get their software, and get up and running without talking to anyone, right? If, you, if your target is 1,000 customers, it's very hard, you know, you're not gonna get there because you think, well, I can get 1,000 customers by building a team of people and supporting them, but they were, no, I want 50,000, which means everything has to be self-service. You've gotta be able to get successful with my software, and you've gotta renew my software without me getting involved too much, right? So it just changes the way you start building the software, the way you build the support teams around it, the way you go to market, everything. Um, and I, I, I love these missions. MuleSoft's one, by the way, just so you know, was to connect the world's applications, data, devices. And that actually completely uh, framed the way we went to market. It meant that we had to connect to absolutely everything. The most legacy system that hasn't been touched in 50 years, all the way through to the newest open source projects. And that was our guiding light, and that's why customers loved us. Right? And it, it really was born out of, we're a connectivity platform. We think our value proposition to the market is to be able to unlock data wherever it is and move it to where you need it in the organization. And so connecting every application, data, and device made a ton of sense for us. Oh, Tesla also has another one. Do you know what theirs is? I can't see the notes. I can't quite remember it. But they, um, it's about... Um, Oh, damn, I can't see my notes, so I can't tell you. But go look it up, it's really good, because again, the reason why you end up you know, building rockets that can land themselves again is because their mission was different to NASA. If NASA's mission was the same as uh, SpaceX's mission, sorry, not Tesla, then um, we might have you know, reusable rockets 15, 20 years ago. Maybe not, I don't know what the engineering challenges are, but uh, they might have been trying it. But these, the missions, these BHAGs, actually help your organization center around some ideals or some goals that allow you to build product differently, build teams differently. And so even though it might sound a bit trite, written on a slide somewhere, um, if you live by it and you remind your organization of it and you start building things that funnel into your mission, the, the company culture really starts to hold cohesion and work much better. Okay, this is my final one, and this is super important for everyone. I failed on this one, by the way. I, uh, this is a, if, if I could do it differently again, this would be my advice, which is you really want to invest more time in yourself, and in particular, in balance in yourself. The one thing I found uh, through building MuleSoft was I became increasingly more unbalanced. Not, in, not like psychologically, but like just in my life. I didn't go nuts in the office or anything. But, you know, I first gave up hobbies. And then I, I gave up social, certain social engagements. Then I start, stopped seeing my friends as much. And then as I got more busy, I didn't see my family as much. And then I had kids and, I, you know, I was traveling a lot and I wasn't always optimizing to see them as much as I, I would have liked. And the reality is, with MuleSoft, I also had an, out, you know, an unbalanced outcome, right? You know, not everyone gets to see an exit, not everyone gets to see an exit like that. And I'm still not sure whether you have to do all the other things I said that I did in MuleSoft in order to get the outcome. But my hunch, looking at the way the world is evolving and how, how things are um, evolving in, in entrepreneurship, that you don't need to be out of balance. 
You just need to be doing more of the right things versus working harder at trying to figure out what the right things are. And this actually goes full circle back to having coaches and peers, like get, having knowledge around you helps you do more smarter things, do less of the wrong things, make less mistakes. And you know, for me, balance is self-care physically. Like the best thing I, I think I did during Mulesoft is I used to run a lot, I used to cycle a lot. So even if I was tra traveling, I'd always have running shoes with me, I'd always go for a run. Uh, and amazingly, what I found out is I did my best thinking when I was running. So, um, you know, it actually works in your favor to invest here. But I will say, after MuleSoft, it took me two years to get myself rebalanced again, like get reconnect with my family and friends the right way, make myself feel like I was centered in the things I really cared about. And now as I, do, I, I build Dig Ventures, I take that with me, right? I, I don't sacrifice everything for Dig Ventures. At some point, I say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to spend time with my daughter right now, and then I'm going to go for a run, and I, I don't care about that meeting, right? And, and you've all got to find your own path there. And I've also met people, I've spoken about this, and they've said, look, I, I do it with balance, and, and it works out well. Some people just naturally do it. But I do see, even in my portfolio of, of founders, that sometimes people start to get off, off track. And I would just say, look, this, you know, it's 12 years for me at MuleSoft. You can't go 12 years without seeing your friends or having hobbies or spending enough time with your family. Time's too short for that. So, Build, but just build smart. Have people around that you can help you really think about uh, the, the direct challenges in front of you and allow you to do more of the right things quicker. And that's pretty much what I learned in 12 years. So thank you.